let's move on to the industrial production of activated carbons. So you know what, what are activated carbons? These are porous carbon structures. They have a very good absorbance because of certain physical and chemical um, activation process. And of course, because of their pore network, because they offer a very high uh, surface area. Okay, so I told you that these uh, are the carbon materials which are used for making, for example, water filtration columns in a number of air purifiers, water purifiers, and so on. How do we make these structures? That is actually not too complicated. So you can, for example, uh, take the some shape of activated carbon. You can take granulated activated carbon. You can take the powder. You can also um, take, uh, you know, larger particles or cylindrical particles, all kinds of shapes, and then you can pack them into a column, depending upon your requirement, depending upon what kind of, uh, uh, you know, what kind of impurities are you uh, planning to trap, you can also, um, you know, activate these carbons in, in, in different ways, you can also use impregnated activated carbons, you can also here and there, um, you know, combine these uh, columns with other, for example, electrochemical uh, reactions, so with all of these things, the physical manufacturing process of a, of a column, water filtration column, for example, would just be to pack a column and have certain, you know, filters and seeds so that, you know, your water before going inside the column, it uh, gets, you know, it gets primary filtration done. And also when it comes out of the, of the filter, then it, um, you know, it does not contain any carbon in it. You need to make sure. So this is basically it. Hmm. Okay. However, what is more important for us is to how to make these granular or activated carbons themselves. Hmm. So what you buy in the market, um, yeah, these cylinders that you see, so how do you manufacture them? Hmm. So that is what we are going to learn. This is what I call the industrial manufacturing of activated carbon, not using activated carbon, but of the carbon itself. Okay. Now, um, so first of all, when we uh, make these uh, any kind of carbon, we need to uh, know what are the uh, what are the suitable precursors for it. So as I have mentioned multiple times, that um, uh, activated carbons are derived from uh, natural polymers in most cases. So for example, wood, which is a lignocellulosic material. Lignocellulosic means the structure itself is made of uh, cellulose, but it also contains a lot of uh, lignins. Huh? Lignin also is a range of compounds which you find these oily compounds and whatever other than cellulose you practically, this is the primary material that you have in the wood and natural, um, natural materials, agricultural uh, waste and, and uh, so basically plant uh, materials. Okay. So lignocellulosic materials are the primary source of activated carbon. Now you can also use, um, for example, certain types of coals. Hmm. So, if you remember, we use needle coke for making graphite. Hmm. We also use certain other types of cokes for making glass-like carbons or other non-graphitizing carbons. Hmm. So, now in the case of activated or, um, you know, char-like carbons, what you could also use is a, are the certain types of coals, not coke, coal. Hmm. So, coals are these relatively porous structures. Now, why do we find all these different petro petrochem? Why do all these different uh, petrochemical precursors give you different types of carbons? Well, they are formed by different precursors. Hmm. So, when you, uh, if you look at the history or uh, you know uh, how they were formed, then all of them were ultimately at some point formed by different uh, types of precursors. Whatever was uh, you know the, the result of conversion of natural wood-like polymers may have converted uh, over time into coal. Now, coals are also of different uh, purities, different qualities. In fact, in different parts of the world, you find different types of coals. Some of them, uh, for example, certain types of bituminous coals and also uh, brown coals, these are also used as precursors for making uh, activated carbons. Hmm. Okay. Now, peat is also one more. So, peat is something which you, um, which is sort of organic material which has partially converted into carbon but not completely yet. Hmm. So peat is also, uh, so all of these materials are basically high carbon containing natural materials. That is what you use as precursors for making activated carbons. Okay. Now you can also utilize certain cokes which do go through softening. So, you know, um, after uh, heat treatment, but if you pre-oxidize them at 150, uh, you know, in this range, 150 to 350 degrees, then you may be able to prevent this softening to some extent. So these are also in, in although rarely they are used, but they are all, they can also be used for, uh, uh, for the formation of activated carbon. There are two main um, 
strategy, so to say. So if you think about the pallets or cylinders of activated carbon, either you can make the pallets before their carbonization itself or you can make it afterwards. So what do you think is better? If you, if you think about the graphite-related uh, manufacturing or glass-like carbon, we are always providing the shape hmm, before the final carbonization step. Hmm. Because that is uh, when once it is carbonized, then it becomes more difficult to, uh, to you know, to give it a shape. Hmm. So these are, this is precisely what we also do in the case of activated carbon. So we usually give the shape beforehand, you know, so you already take the precursor and, and, and make cylinders out of it hmm, and then carbonize them. However, in certain cases, if you have a precursor that will not give you or it's very difficult to, um, you know, to shape it, to form it. In that case, what you can also have is you can get the powder of activated carbon and then afterwards you can use a binder and then provide a shape. Okay, so these strategies I have, I have prepared sort of a chart. There you can see, so you take a polymer precursor. Now you can either you know so you what you want to do is you want to make pallets so for making pallets what do you need to do let's say i, I give you a lot of wood hmm? now first you need to you need to crush it you need to make sure that you know you have basically you'll have to dry it first and then crush it hmm? and make uniform sort of particles hmm? okay you may also need to do sieving hmm? because if you do the crushing of of materials such as wood or Sometimes the seeds of the stones, these are also precursors for uh, for uh, uh, making activated carbons. In fact, in India, you, you often use coconut shell for making activated carbon, which actually gives you very good quality activated carbon. So what you would do is you do uh, crushing and then also sieving to remove like really big uh, particles and to sort of make the size to some extent uniform. Hmm. Now you can either do crushing and then further milling uh, rather than sieving and removing the bigger particles you want to make sure that all the particles are utilized so in that case for bigger particles you might do milling so these kind of processes you will do to uh, reduce the particle size or if you want to uh, so you remember that in the case of chemi chemical activation of uh, carbons what we do we pre-treat them hmm. so in the case of physical activation we don't but in the case of chemical activation you would pre-treat your precursor so the pretreatment already degrades to some extent your cellulose, which makes it easier to shape it. So these are the three pathways you will use in the beginning. Okay, now let's talk about the third one where we do the crushing and milling. So we have uh, basically a powder hmm, of your precursor material. Now what you will do is here at this stage already, you will mix it with a binder. Now this binder again can be resin. In most cases, binders have some sort of resins. Hmm which uh, may not really give you char like carbon but you're using reasonably small quantities and you need certain binder to hold and to, to make pallets you definitely need certain type of binder so that is what you will do and then you might use extrusion techniques so extrusion is where you um, you know you we also use extrusion in the case of uh, graphite related manufacturing also for plastic materials Huh. Uh, so plastic extrusion uh, is a very common manufacturing technique. So you will take now this mixture of your uh, cellulosic material, material and binder and then you will perform the extrusion to, to give it whatever shape is desired. And if needed, then you will do drying or even cross-linking depending upon what kind of binder did you use. Okay, now you perform the carbonization. So now either you perform the carbonization for these particles which are mixed and you know you use the binder and you made the cylinders or you can directly, uh, if you wanted powdered uh, activated carbon, for example, after crushing and sieving what you had in the first strategy, you can already carbonize that. Hmm. Or if you were doing the chemical activation, then the pre-treated uh, material that you have, whether or not you made pallets out of it, you could then carbonize it. So after all of these steps, you will now perform your carbonization. Um, and you know that this carbonization is not performed at, um, you know, as high temperatures as you would use for graphite. Hmm. So relatively lower, like, let's say around 1100 degree uh, centigrade carbonization. After this, so now you have a porous carbon uh, material hmm, in whatever shape you, uh, you wanted it. Now you perform the activation. So in the case of chemical activation, this activation process already sort of started when you did the impregnation but now you will um, you know you will further uh, do some physical activation using steam for example and this is your activation step and 
Now, after the activation, depending upon, again, what kind of shapes do you want? Hmm. Do you want to do sizing? Sizing typically means that you, um, you know, cut pieces of, so if I make a very long cylinder and I want to make small cylinders out of it, that would be, uh, that would be sizing. Hmm. So this you can perform, if you have powder, you can perform sieving again, because you remember that there will be some change in the size during this process of carbonization. Hmm. It may not shrink as much as the um, you know other polymers shrink, other resins shrink, but some shrinkage will take place. Not just some shrinkage, but also because of all of this uh, sort of harsh processing inside your furnace, you may end up losing. So some of your um, your material will erode. Hmm. So that some carbon particles will come out. Some of these uh, cylinders may you know break, or so some some material damage might happen. So you need to purify again. You need to sort your uh, structures again so you will perform sieving and sizing these kind of operations or if you wanted a powdered carbon then you will perform perform uh, grinding or in some cases screening at the end you will perform some conditioning hmm. so this is like a finishing step uh, so you will perform certain conditioning and ensure that you have a material with a good good purity um, and uniformity and then finally you will have different types of uh, of activated carbons you can have granulated powder or pallets hmm. so this is basically the idea is that you will either perform the um, uh, shaping before uh, in the precursor itself or you will have the material and then afterwards you will have a binder okay um yeah now coming to uh, so in the next slide i'm going to tell you how do we perform the activation step so this is like the overall process you will use starting from the precursor. But now we are going to the step where we perform the activation of porous carbons. So the activation is performed in different types of furnaces. What you need is basically a furnace for all the carbon related operations. What is very important is high temperature furnace and these furnaces must have a controlled environment. Hmm. Now, you even if you do want to supply air in certain cases, hmm, or you want to supply steam, or you want to supply um, an inert gas, hmm, or you want to supply a mixture of gases, in all cases, what you need is a furnace which has a uniform, uh, which has a very controlled environment. Hmm. However, the size of these furnaces can vary. So you can actually have these really massive furnaces that um, that actually have a capacity of several tons of material at the same time. Mm. So you have really massive furnaces for uh, processing for the industrial process of carbons. At the same time, if you're making a micro nano device, you will use a lab furnace where you know you, you have the tube diameter of, for example, just a couple of centimeters. So the size of the furnaces uh, may vary, but um, the principle remains the same. Mm. Now, in, in metallurgy, you would read about several types of furnaces, different materials, different elements, different ores are processed in a certain different type of process because, uh, because of that mainly depends on number one, the byproducts that come out of it, or also the, um, you know, these, some of these byproducts can be corrosive or they can be very harmful, or they can also sometimes be used uh, as a uh, primary material, as an initial material for, for some other chemical process. So depending upon these, you basically want to, you, you change the shape and size of the furnace. Okay. Now for activated carbons, the production of activated carbon is typically done at a very large scale. So these, the, the, the furnaces that I was talking about, the several tons uh, of capacity, those are the kind of things you, you, uh, you will potentially use for making large scale activated carbons. Hmm. Okay, that is also the reason you have hmm, this material is relatively cheap. Hmm. Now, when you use these kind of massive furnaces, you may not be able to perform joule heating using coils, huh, which you would do in a lab furnace. Hmm. So you have a coil around your ceramic tube or quartz tube, and then that is what is performing the uh, you know, the heating, the, providing the heat. But in the case of you know several meters long furnace, you will rather use um, fuel. You will just use, uh, you know, uh, petroleum fuel and you, you will, using these hot gases, you will perform the heating. In this case, it's also um, not too difficult because the temperatures are not terribly high. Mm. So rotary kiln is the first uh, type of furnace that I'm going to talk about. This is the one that is most 
commonly used for making um, for making the activated carbons mm, for activation of carbons okay uh, and there are two other uh, types of furnaces or reactors that we are going to talk about that is uh, one is the multiple hearth furnace or the fluidized fluidized uh, bed furnace or you can also call it a reactor. Reactor is a word typically we use when we have certain chemical reactions going on. Here you can also just call it a furnace. Hmm. Okay, so the first one, the rotary kiln. Hmm. This is like a, this is a very large tube-like structure, several meters long. Hmm. So this is a metallic, typically made of cast iron tube, hmm. um, which you will also maybe make in separate parts and join them together. But this is a very large metallic tube where you have the, steam and the hot gas hot hot gas here is the is the one that is produced by your fuel hmm. now you can also have carbon dioxide you can also have other gases whatever you require for uh, for your activation hmm, of that type of type of carbon so you have a very big tube but this is where you have the steam flowing or whatever gases you need what you have is the starting material here because now we are talking only about activation and not about the carbonization process huh so starting material is your low purity carbon now, low purity carbons produced by the charring process are simply called chars. Hmm. You will also hear the term biochar because often these materials are prepared by biological, uh, you know, um, like plant materials and so on. And in many cases nowadays, um, they are prepared by waste materials. In fact, even if I talk about coconut shell or any fruit, um, you know, stones and so on, these are waste materials. So waste is, um, you know, your waste can be a starting material or useful material for, for something else. You know, it, it's just waste for us, but it can be used. Also agricultural and forestry waste of, of all kind can be used for making chars. And these chars now are, they, they are prepared at lower temperatures, so they contain impurities. Now, however, they do contain porosity. So that those are our starting materials. And now we we put them in our tube. Now, one thing you will notice in this tube is that it is, it's an inclined tube. Huh? It's not a perfectly horizontal tube. It's slightly inclined. And there's a reason for it. If you have the tube that is inclined, then the material can, can move along hmm? due to gravity. It will just, uh, you know, move forward. Hmm? Okay. Now, as the name suggests, this is a rotary kiln huh? so this this entire thing keeps on rotating your entire cylinder keeps rotating so if you've seen um you know cement uh, your concrete making you know on a construction site so you see these these rotating uh, for mixing you use these um rotational uh, devices so this is also something that the entire thing rotates so that your material um your char inside that can keep on rotating hmm. okay what else do you have here I said that the temperature is uh, okay you have fuel you have hot gases but what you do is you are often putting your uh, source of heat on the other side you know opposite side of the feed why are you doing that so that the temperature increases this way uh, sorry the, the uh, gases flow this way so the when you uh, the temperature you can see the arrow here the temperature as you go like this so it's, the more you go towards the end of the furnace the temperature increases because the uh, heat source is at the end of the furnace. Hmm. Okay, why? Again, so that your material slowly heats up. Hmm. It does not immediately experience a very high temperature. It gradually experiences a higher temperature. Hmm. And the impurities are gradually removed. Hmm. The byproducts, so you can have tar-like impurities. You can also have, uh, you can have other things. You also want to make sure that you impregnate steam into it. Hmm. So in initial stages will remove your impurities and at some point you will also get the material uh, uh, the impregnated with superheated steam. Hmm. So the temperature is, uh, is increasing along the length of the furnace. Okay. Now, um, yeah, so at, at the end, now you also have the uh, material moving due to gravity. And at the end, your entire, the, whatever is the processed activated carbon that you will collect. So this here, I have, I, I have drawn only a very basic schematic, of course. This is not how an industrial plant would look like. huh? These are, as I mentioned, these are massive structures. They, then they will have a lot of different seals. Hmm. You will have gas outlets. You may have multiple gas outlets. You will also have some steam injection, gas injection. So inlets and outlets of all sorts uh, you will have. Different valves, different seals, different. Uh, um, also these two 
big uh, structures they are like uh, they are like tires around they are not rubber tires but these are called tires so these are ring like structures around your um, around your furnace or kiln you can even move this entire thing so this this is the basic diagram the idea you can understand now what is why are we doing all of this there must be some advantage of this kind of design right why are we not using just a standard furnace we are using this tube like furnace because um, okay number one in all tube like furnaces all the by products can be relatively easily removed but here the scale of manufacturing is 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 so large that our goal is also to make sure that all the particles that we have all the char particles that we have inside whatever is the particle size we want to make sure that all of them experience as much heat as possible all of them also come in contact with the steam for as long as possible hmm. this time this duration of uh, the your your uh, solid material coming in contact with the with the gases this time is known as the residence time hmm. so for how long does it experience uh, the whatever is the gas around it okay so you want to increase the residence time and and you want to also make sure that all the surfaces of your particles experience some heat hmm. okay so if you keep on rotating them hmm, then you can see that there is uh, then you always the each surface has the probability of coming in contact uh, for you know for a long enough duration hmm, uh, coming in contact with the steam or other gases also this will lead to the heat transfer between the particles hmm. so heat transfer is not just between the wall of the furnace hmm, and your particles whatever the particle bed on that surface but now your heat transfer is also between the particles hmm. so to ensure all of these things that that is how these these are some of the advantages of this design okay um yeah all and of course one more advantage is that you don't really need to push the particles so you don't need to remove them uh, because of their weight because as they keep getting closer they will they will because of the inclination they will you know by themselves they will uh, you know come towards the outlet hmm. okay um yeah and one more advantage of this uh, because these are very large tubes hmm. so you can control the temperature gradient very well hmm, because they are really massive in fact you may have multiple burners to uh, to uh, heat your uh, entire structure so you can have a good thermal gradient which means again your particle is experiencing experiencing slow increase in the temperature and that's why the process is more controlled so these are the advantages now what would so if you if you have to decide the uh, rate of production hmm, uh, then what are the things that number one how fast you rotate your kiln hmm, number 2 what is the angle at which your kiln is tilted because that's how you know that will determine how fast your particles move and they come out of course depending upon the uh, rate of the feed you know how much how much char you're feeding in so that would also how much uh, activated carbon you're taking out hmm. so feed in mass in mass out that will determine the uh, the uh, production speed and of course also other factors such as the steam injection hmm, because that would determine the residence time sometimes you want to increase the residence time sometimes you want to decrease depending upon um, what kind of steam is it superheated steam for how long do you and also it depends on the particle size and so on so all of these things will determine the um, the rate of your production okay now um, yeah as i mentioned already that they have uh, these uh, furnaces have uh, several tons capacity sometimes in certain cases you may also use high temperature rotary uh, rotary uh, kilns so, so the temperatures can go up to 2000 kelvin in some cases okay now the um uh, often when you are uh, operating any such uh, plant or chemical reactor of any kind not just for activated carbon you will first perf perform certain uh, simulations hmm. so you want to understand how your your entire setup is going to function and then accordingly you will de decide on the process parameters or the feed rate and so on hmm. okay so typically whenever you want to model something if i if i say that you you need to model um, you know or simulate a, the operation of a certain um, rotary kiln what you need to take care of is number one the mass balance hmm. so mass you need to make sure the the mass in mass out not just the char and activated carbon but also the mass of the steam also uh, how much solid is getting converted into vapor how much vapor is uh, you know uh, converting into liquid and so on so you need to perform 
um, you need to take care of or you need to understand all sorts of uh, mass balance. You need to also understand the energy balance. Hmm. And of course, that is closely closely uh, related to your heat transfer. So um, all sorts of heat trans transfer, whether it is between the walls, it is between the inner wall, outer wall. From outer wall, what is the heat that is uh, uh, you know being released uh, into the um, environment? Mm -hmm. And all sorts of whether it is convective heat, whether it is radiative heat, you need to factor in all of these things and then maybe come up with some differential equations and then then you this is how you model your system and then you perform the simulations and then you figure out what are the parameters that are required for your process. The next type of furnace that is used uh, in the case of activated carbon manufacturing is um, known as the multiple hearth furnace. So hearth is basically these furnaces that are made of bricks, you know, more like this fireplace kind of, uh, of furnace. Mm. So you have basically refractory material. Mm. Okay. So this is a schematic diagram of these hearth furnaces. Now the name itself says multiple hearth furnaces. So here I have shown these eight stages. Mm. You can have multiple stages. You can have less. You can have more. The idea here is that you have these multiple hearth furnaces connected. This is a vertical system. Hmm. And um, you have various heating zones. You also you can have various cooling zones also, and you can also have steam injection or whatever is your gas injection also at multiple uh, stages. Hmm. So wh what do we have here? We have this one shaft you can see in the in the center. Hmm. This shaft is rotating. Hmm. Now you have these disc-like structures. Hmm. So this is a cross section here you see disc-like structure, hmm. and you pour your uh, feed from the top, hmm, your char. Hmm. Now it goes, let's say, on stage one, and then you have what is known as rabble arm. Hmm. Rabble arm are these uh, these uh, structures which are made for uh, sort of rotating or spreading your uh, uh, the material. Hmm. So they are made for rotation. So that now, now the material is rotated on the furnace number one, after that, it goes to number two. After that, it goes to number three and so on. And then again, different processes are taking place at different stages. So what is the difference in the rotary kiln? You had sort of a continuous operation, but here you don't have continuation of heat. You have these well-defined stages and the number of stages you can determine. Okay. Now, what happens at these different stages? Basically, on the first stage, if you have sort of some moisture in your, uh, uh, in your chart, so first some drying will take place second stage there will be some pyrolysis hmm. you may uh, so pyrolysis also if you if you take the precursor and you want to make the coal for that also these kind of furnaces can be used hmm. okay but in the case of uh, when you want to uh, convert them into um, when you want to just perform the activation in that case pyrolysis may take place if you have some organic material left over in it Hmm. So, uh, for example, for very low purity chars, so, so there may be some pyrolysis, some combustion also, if you want to burn away the undesired impurities. Okay, so that will take place. Now you will also have then some fixed carbon burn. So, fixed fixed carbon is the carbon that you would you don't want to lose. Hmm. Okay, now but some gasification burning will take place as well. That is that is what happens at the time of um, of uh, of your activation. You know that you do lose some carbon mass during the activation. Okay, now also then you if whenever there is certain burning, hmm, oxygen is present and you have some burning. In that case, you will get some ash. Hmm. Ash is actually a big problem in furnaces. In all industrial processes, it is the ash formation. Um, especially in the case of carbonization, pyrolysis plants, base treatment plants, uh, it's the ash formation, ash content that's a big problem. What we would like to have is so there are there is certain type of ash which is extremely light and it flies. Hmm. So it basically goes on top, and then there is certain type of ash which is relatively heavy, or the particle size is large enough, or the process is done in such a way that the ash can be collected in the bottom. So here in this particular furnace, you can see this is a vertical furnace. So whatever products are, are, are being generated, they are coming to the bottom. So the ash can also be collected in the bottom, which is a good thing. This type of furnace does not um, generate much fly ash. Hmm. Okay, so this is also uh, an advantage of this type of furnace. 
so again why would you choose a rotary kiln or why would you choose this that would also depend on your um, on your precursor whatever type of char you have whether you have a um, already high purity char or you're using certain type of coals and trying to activate them hmm. or you're just uh, using a um, you know very low purity char uh, from for example um, uh, something that is generated from waste so depending upon that because that will also determine how much ash content you will have so how do you want to collect it and so on so the, based on these things you can also choose this type of furnace so these are some other uh, things that i have already uh, told you rabble arms are rotating your material hot gases hmm. so here also you're performing the uh, heating by using simple fuels hmm. so hydrocarbon fuels so the hot gases then these hot gases are flowing upward so here also you have a count of flow of heat similar to, similar to rotary kiln so you have heat from one side and heat from the other side again for to ensure the same thing that the material slowly goes towards the higher temperature hmm. okay um and then of course again you will have several um you know injections where you can insert uh, inject your steam or carbon dioxide also you will have some other outlets some gas exhaust outlet huh, this gas exhaust by the way they, it's also known as flue gas the exhaust gases okay now the problem with this kind of uh, furnace is that compared to the rotary kiln you have relatively lower residence time hmm. and that is why sometimes your um, you know the carbon can be of relatively inferior quality um, quality but also you can use these kind of furnaces in fact they are uh, rather used for um, reuse of the activated carbon so these active all activated carbons can also be reused uh, so once for example in your house water water purification column once it gets sort of saturated with the impurities then what you can do is you can just you know remove the carbon again you can take the carbon out of the furnace uh, of your column and then reheat it hmm. so for these kind of recycling purposes reheating purposes there these kind of um, uh, furnaces are more uh, commonly used hmm. okay what will be the optimization parameter for this kind of furnace number of hertz so how many stages do you want that is very important you know how many what type of operations do you perform if you have too much moisture or if you have you know how do you want to gradually increase the temperature also so these the number of hertz is important then of course um, because as i said this, these uh, rabble arms are rotating your material hmm. so that kind of the speed of that rotation hmm, the, because that would decide your residence time of course the temperature at various uh, stages and feed rate feed rate feed in feed out all of these things are your optimization parameters for these kind of furnaces okay so the third one um that we will quickly discuss is the fluidized bed uh, type furnace hmm. okay fluidized bed um the concept of fluid what is a fluidized bed hmm. what you <laughs> so it, it suggests that there is certain fluid in it huh? but it's not just a fluid what you have is you also have solid particles mixed inside that fluid so they are like suspended solid particles in a fluid with the fluid can by the way also be a gas hmm. so what will happen is you have you make this mixture in such a way and also you create so much turbulence in that fluid that basically your entire mixture of solid particles in the fluid the entire mixture behaves like one single fluid hmm. so that is the idea of any fluidized bed reactor now this is um you you can have different chemical reactions also uh, the, these reactors are, are used more for different um, other uh, chemical reactions because there you can have for example one matrix and then you have the particles you want these particles to react with the matrix hmm? or you want to even perform certain types of coating on top of your uh, of your uh, particles in that case this is perfect right because if your particles are suspended inside a fluid hmm, then each surface all the time is coming in contact with the fluid so if you want to perform certain reaction with the fluid then that is perfect in our case um, you can have steam and you can have the uh, char particles suspended in it hmm. and now if this entire material this entire uh, mixture behaves like one single fluid then then we can control their flow rate then we then basically whatever we we do to the fluid hmm, uh, that is how we can treat this entire uh, entire mixture hmm, which is actually what you can also call it's a heterogeneous fluid hmm. however we sort of when we think of this heterogeneous fluid we do consider one single bulk density 
So we don't say that the density of particle is this and the density of the fluid is this. We just think of this entire mixture as one single fluid and then we consider the bulk density for it. And that's how when that is what you would use if you want to model it hmm. or if you want to calculate any uh, properties, any, any parameters or simulate anything. Okay. Now, um, this, um, of course, the uh, advantage. So the, the, the principle, the operation principle is simple. Hmm. You see that in the, in the figure, you see that you have the char in, you have activated carbon out. There is certain fuel, there's certain gas and steam injection. Hmm. And the flue gas, gas huh, the exhaust gas can go out uh, from somewhere. So this is very, the, the idea is that you have this mixture of uh, fluid and solid. And it is always, there is always almost a continuous turbulence created. So then you are, uh, at all times, the particles are, in suspended in that in that fluid hmm. okay uh, so now here you can imagine that because the reaction is happening all the time you actually need smaller residence times in fact if you end up having a very long residence time you know that you may end up losing your carbon so the optimization of residence time here becomes important because the reaction is relatively quick because all the surfaces are always uh, so this is like a very what should i say very not harsh but it's a constant reaction hmm. so that is why it is uh, it is important uh, that you ensure that you have the not very long residence times hmm. okay um yeah so um also what will happen is because your steam or hot gas whatever gas is always it it, it is around that your coal part your charred particle all the time with very high velocities so heat transfer is also relatively fast so because of all these factors you need to make sure that you don't leave the carbon for too long inside the uh, inside the furnace or you may end up losing the carbon mass huh, the fixed carbon mass okay um yeah so this reaction can also cause mechanical damage because um, of the the velocity of the fluid hmm. so you may because uh, these char like particles activated carbons they are not um, they are not mechanically too strong, at least as compared to other carbon materials. Hmm. So you may also get some erosion from the surface. These are the things that you will um, you will need to optimize. Okay. Now, of course, these. Why will you use in which type of carbons you will uh, activated carbon? You will use it rather for the powder for two reasons. One, that the damage to the powder surface is less. Hmm. If you have bigger particles, you may end up crushing them. And also because the powder is light, so the particles are very light, so it is easier for them to um, yeah, to, 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 to have them, uh, you know, in the fluidized bed. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah, these are also used for, um, for reusing or reheating the activated carbon. The good thing, in fact, the one big advantage of activated carbons is that you can always reuse them. Hmm. So whenever your uh, the, the, the activation uh, absorption is exhausted, your material is, is saturated with it. In that case, you can just heat, heat it again, wash it again with several chemicals and you, you again have your activated carbon ready. Hmm. So this is also one uh, reason that this is a very important um, uh, industrial material. Okay, if you want to read further on activated carbon, this is in itself a very uh, vast field of research. Um, this is one book that I suggest. There are also several um, papers, review articles that you can read. This Activated carbon is also very important for waste treatment and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, carbonization that takes. So if you carbonize waste polymers, often you end up getting either a mixed type of carbon or you get porous carbon. You don't get good quality graphite or glass like carbon, of course, from the waste. Hmm. So in that case, conversion of char into activated carbon and then utilizing um, these activated carbons for different processes. That is very important.